Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you so much for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's March 2nd, and there are just 18 days until the first day of spring. Today, we're going to celebrate the man who went to Mexico as an ambassador and then sent back the plant that became synonymous with Christmas. I bet you already know what I'm talking about. And then we'll learn about a gardener who worked for 50 years to create one of England's top gardens. And I find his story to be absolutely heartbreaking. And I'm so happy that today we get to shine a spotlight on just who this man was. We'll also hear a charming account of Spring's Flower Show. It's a little humorous as well. And then we grow that garden library today with a fantastic book for gardeners who want to ferment their garden harvest. So if you've been looking for a very sound reference, a masterclass in fermentation, this is one of the books that you're going to want to get. And then we'll wrap things up with the sweet little story about the state flower of Idaho. But before we get to all of that, I just wanted to start the show out by talking about something I wrote about in the newsletter this past Friday. And that had to do with using Google Earth to create a map of your property so that you can use it for garden design purposes. And, you know, I have to say that it's been a long time since I used Google Earth, but it is so cool now because you start out in space if you just go to googleearth.com and then enter your address and you kind of fly in from space, takes you right to your little home and you'll see your property there. And once you do that, all you need to do is basically take a screenshot and you'll have a perfect representation of your property. And then I showed how I used Canva to create a garden design for my little garden, my little front yard up here at the cabin, because there are some things I want to do. And I just hope that if you're thinking about doing anything on your property that you take advantage of this, it's totally free. And it's so wonderful to have a perfect map of your garden to work with when you're working on design. So if you missed the newsletter, if you don't subscribe and you'd like to get that particular newsletter, all you need to do is subscribe to the newsletter. So head on over to the dailygardener.org and then sign up for the newsletter and then follow that up with an email to me at jennifer at the dailygardener.org and I'll send you a copy of that newsletter so that you have that that you can reference. Anyway, I think that's super handy, and I've already had a friend reach out and ask if I would help them with their garden that way, and I love playing around with garden design like that. I love helping people figure out ways that they can turn what they consider to be useless space into functional space, an outdoor room or something that they can just enjoy with their family. And I think Google Earth is a marvelous, marvelous tool to have in your toolkit for that. And even if you don't want to do design work, it's awfully fun to have a map of your property. It becomes especially helpful if you're picking out trees and you're trying to figure out what's an appropriate tree canopy size. And I was thinking that it would definitely be a fun activity to do with the kids is just have them play around on Google Earth. It's so fascinating. Well, anyway, enough of that. It's time for today's Curated Garden News. Today's curated garden news comes from UPI, and it was written by Brooke Hayes. This was a post that appeared in their science news segment. The title is, Urban Pollinators Get Almost All of Their Food from Backyard Gardens. 
Now, this article is actually a review of a study that was done in England. And I found this post to be especially insightful because if you have a garden and you think that your garden is making a difference to pollinators, but you're just not sure, well, guess what? Your instincts are correct. In fact, this particular study was trying to measure that. Do backyard gardens make a discernible difference for pollinators? And the answer is they absolutely do. And I wanted to share two little excerpts with you right now, just in case you don't get the chance to read this article, because I think this information is so important for gardeners to know about. Here's the first excerpt. It says, In a first-of-its-kind study, researchers in Britain determined just three home gardens can yield a teaspoon of nectar each day. That's enough food to nourish thousands of bees. So there we have our quantification. And then here's the other excerpt. It says, our findings highlight the pivotal role that gardens play in supporting pollinators and promoting biodiversity in urban areas compared to the nectar generated in the countryside where just a few species produce most of the sugar liquid consumed by pollinators The bounty of nectar found in the city and suburbs is produced by a wide variety of plant species. And gardens are important because they produce the most nectar per unit area of land, and they cover the largest area of land in the cities that they studied. So gardens are tremendously important to pollinators. They're more important even than the green spaces that you'll find in the city, like parks or green areas around office buildings. Our gardens are vitally important to pollinators. And if you can, do your best this season to add more plants that are pollinator friendly. Leave those plants up in the fall through the winter because that's important as well. And continue to think about diversity, plant diversity. So if your garden only has four or five types of flowers, think about ways that you can supplement that with herbs, with other ornamentals, with edibles, and so forth. Because in general, when it comes to the health of pollinators, to their ability to thrive, plant diversity is so crucial. All right. Now, if you would like to read this article for yourself, and I think it's a really good one, all you need to do is head on over to the Facebook group for the show and search for the word pollinator. And this post will pop right up. Now, before I continue on with the rest of the show, I also wanted to take a second and welcome the new members that have joined the Facebook group. I meant to do this last week. And of course, time got away from me. So let me make sure to welcome these new members, Marcy Douglas, Kathy Creveline, Kendra Renee Stepp, Lindsay Casey Franklin, Eugene Van Az, Andrea Wilson, Kathy Engelke Wadowitz, Laura Emily, Pam Burke Atkinson, Randy Brodsky, Tony Struther, Paula Blum, Betsy Madsen, Al Gwyn Schill, Tracy Brailsford, Troy Weathers, Marcia Sparling, Ryan Ness, Amanda Dolan, Melissa Johnson, and Rachel Hutchings. Welcome, you guys. Now, if you would like to join the Daily Gardener community, the Facebook group for the show, it's really so easy to join. All you need to do is head on up to the search bar where you'd search for a friend and then type in Daily Gardener community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. It's time for Botanical History. All right, here is some botanical history for March 2nd. Today is the birthday of the physician, botanist, and American statesman, Joel Roberts Poinsett. 
In the 1820s, President John Quincy Adams appointed Joel to serve as the U.S. ambassador in Mexico. Joel was introduced to a beautiful plant that the Aztecs called Cuetla Xochitl, but we simply call it the poinsettia. Now, the Aztecs used to extract a purple dye from the poinsettia, which they used for decorative purposes. And like most euphorbias, the poinsettia has a white sap, and the Aztecs used that white sap to treat wounds, skin diseases, and fever, which is how it got the common name skin flower. The Aztecs also used the leaves of the poinsettia to make tea, and they used poinsettia tea to increase breast milk in nursing mothers. In warm climates like Mexico, the poinsettia grows year-round, and it can grow up to 16 feet tall. Well, in 1825, when Joel Poinsett sent clippings of the plant back home to South Carolina, botanists had new common names for the plant. They called it the Mexican fire plant, or the painted leaf. And it was the botanist Carl Villano who named the poinsettia the Euphorbia pulcherima. Pulcherima means beautiful. And already in 1836, newspapers were reporting this. Poinsettia pulcherima, the bracts which surround the numerous flowers, are the most brilliant rosy crimson color the splendor of which is quite dazzling. Few, if any, of the most highly valued beauties of our gardens can vie with this. Indeed, when we take into consideration the profuse manner in which it flowers, the luxuriance of its foliage, and the long duration of the bracts, We are not aware of any plant more deserving in collections than this lovely and highly prized stranger. And today, every year on December 12th, the day Joel Poinsett died, we celebrate National Poinsettia Day. And today is also the birthday of the head gardener at Worley Place, John Jacob Maurer, who was born on this day, March 2nd in 1875. Jacob's story is intertwined with the enormously wealthy English horticulturist Ellen Ann Wilmot, who was 17 years older than Jacob. In 1875, the year Jacob was born, Ellen's parents moved to Worley Place, a beautiful natural property set on 33 acres of land in Essex. As it turned out, Ellen lived there for the rest of her life. Every member of the Wilmont family loved gardening, and Ellen's parents often invited the Swiss botanist and world-renowned alpine specialist Henri Coravon to be a guest in their home. When Ellen's wealthy aunt and godmother, Countess Helen Trasker, died, Ellen inherited some significant money. And when her father died, Ellen became the owner of Worley Place. With her large inheritance and the keys to the property she had grown to love, Ellen planted to her heart's content. Ellen also quickly hired over a hundred gardeners to help transform Worley Place into one of the world's top botanical gardens. One time, when Ellen was visiting Henri Coravon's nursery in Switzerland, she learned that he was quite pleased with a new gardener named Jacob. And after watching him work, Ellen hired him away with a promise to provide him a retirement package, which included a house to live in and a pension of a pound a week. The year was 1894. 
And Jacob Maurer was 19 years old the day he left Switzerland for Worley Place. Well, Ellen proved to be a hard taskmaster and a cold, unfailing boss. She fired any gardener who she deemed responsible for allowing a weed to grow in one of her beds. In fact, she once derided her own sex by saying women would be a disaster in the border. And by that, she meant the garden. Well, Ellen blew through her inheritance pretty quickly. She used her money to set up three lavish homes, each with impressive gardens of their own, one in France, one in Italy, and Worley Place. And Ellen also funded trips for plant explorers like Ernest Henry Wilson. And in return, she not only received the latest plants, but many were named in her honor. For all her fortune and connections, Ellen died penniless and heartbroken. Ellen had been reckless with her spending, and her personality could be distasteful haughty, and demanding. By the mid-1900s, Ellen's top breeders began to leave Worley, and Jacob ended up becoming Ellen's most trusted employee, and he stayed on with his large family living in a building on the property called South Lodge. And today, while there are many people who long to restore Worley Place to its former glory, most folks forget that Ellen's Worley Place was created on the backs of men like Jacob Maurer, who worked unbelievable hours each week without recognition or regard. Jacob raised his family at South Lodge in impoverished conditions on 18 shillings a week, and he worked six days a week at Worley. To supplement the family's food, Jacob grew onions, leeks, and potatoes, and he tended to these crops in the evening after his daily job was finished. Occasionally, he would find partridge eggs on the edge of the pond, and the eggs were the only bonus that Jacob ever received. And while Jacob could write in English very well, he had trouble speaking English. Jacob and his wife, Rosina, had four sons, Max, John Jacob Jr., Ernest, and Alfred. And then next, they had five daughters, and Jacob named them all after flowers, Rose, Violet, Lily, Marguerite, and Iris. Iris's delivery was difficult, and Rosina developed tuberculosis. Ellen tried to find a place for Rosina to get treatment, but when she couldn't find one, she did nothing else to help Rosina or Jacob. Iris was born in May of 1917, and by the following May, Rosina died. She was just 34 years old. Now, to me, the most heartbreaking passages from Audrey's book are when she describes the conditions of Jacob's life, like when botanical guests from Kew or universities would visit. While the distinguished guests could tell that Jacob was very knowledgeable and was an excellent gardener, They couldn't understand him when he spoke during tours, and so invariably, they would just turn and leave him in the garden. All the credit would go to Ellen, and in fact, Gertrude Jekyll once said that Ellen was the greatest living woman gardener on the planet. And today, we know that she accomplished so much with the help of over a hundred men and from Jacob, who worked at Worley for over half a century. And she also included this passage, which I thought really gave us a glimpse into Jacob's life as head gardener. 
Ellen would never actually cross the threshold of Self Lodge, for it would have seemed to her a very undignified thing to do. Instead, she approached as nearly as she thought she could without losing face and standing just inside the yard, but not inside the bones of the little hedge which separated the vegetable garden, she would yell, Jacob, Jacob, in a high-pitched authoritative staccato. At whatever time of day or night, and whether or no he was in the middle of a meal, Jacob hastened to the call. He was bred to obey, and she expected it of him. Today, there is so little information about Jacob that I put together that tree for him on Ancestry. I could see that he remarried the Worley Place caretaker's daughter, Maggie, after losing his wife. I could see that he had died in Switzerland. What I discovered in Audrey's book was that Jacob was 69 years old when his boss, Ellen Wilmot, died. And Audrey describes what happened next to Jacob this way. Jacob suffered greatly from the dismembering of the garden he had attended so faithfully. He sorrowfully packed up his beloved plants. Apparently, the whole garden was taken apart, boxed up, and shipped away. And Jacob had the worry of what to do when the estate was finally sold. He saw the promise of a little house and the pound-per-week pension, which had first persuaded him to leave Geneva fading before his eyes. His anxiety pressed too hard, and Jacob began to show fears of being followed and persecuted. South Lodge was sold, and Jacob and his wife had to leave. Jacob felt the need to return to his native Switzerland, and he lived there with Maggie for two unhappy years until in the summer of 1937, he committed suicide. And then Audrey writes, the bitter end of a lifetime of labor and a hard reward for a kindly and lovable man. Isn't that terribly sad? Well, today, Worley Place is a wild nature reserve, and it's maintained by the Essex Wildlife Trust in England. It's time for Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words will cheer us up. They're from Leonard H. Robbins from his book, Cure It with a Garden, one of my favorites. And this is an excerpt from his section called Spring's Fashion Show. The goddess Spring is thought of as being truly rural, but that is a mistake. She makes her first appearance in great stony cities like New York. When the suburban garage roof is still white with frost and the perennial bed is a glacier, spring comes to town. Here, just around the corner from billion-dollar banks are show windows filled with downy new-hatched chicks, and along the curb are thickets of naked young apple trees and clumps of bundled evergreens. Further uptown, Spring hires a hall and displays a flower show. Bless her kind heart. And in walk the familiar creatures loved of old and wonderful blushing debutantes, a proud young rose, a yellow Darwin tulip whose bulb is worth its weight in silver, new sweet peas showing off their lustrous frocks, dainty primrose visitors from the old world, strange bright gallardias from western deserts, new gladioli from Nepal by way of Indiana, and new Welsh daffodils, Americanized in Virginia, and all of these move in spring's procession. 
There is one thing about it, says Spring, as she mops her fevered brow. I don't have to market my goods. My customers like everything I display. They are already persuaded. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Fermented Vegetables by Kirsten and Christopher Shockey. This book came out in 2014, and the subtitle is Creative Recipes for Fermenting 64 Vegetables and Herbs. In this book, Kirsten and Christopher share how to make fermented foods, and with their straightforward guidance, you'll soon realize it's the easiest and most miraculous activity you'll ever experiment with in your kitchen. The Shockies are pros when it comes to fermenting, and they share their top recipes for fermenting 64 different vegetables and herbs. Fermentation is not a mystery, but it can be intimidating without a clear understanding. And this is where Kirsten and Christopher's step-by-step directions will help you master the process of lacto-fermentation, a classic preserving method from brine and salt to techniques and seasoning. And in addition to their tried and true recipes, Kirsten and Christopher add suggestions, tips, and advice for each vegetable. This book is 368 pages of fermentation basics that will help you create nutrient-dense live foods packed with vitamins, minerals, enzymes, and probiotic goodness for you and your family. You can get a copy of Fermented Vegetables by Kirsten and Christopher Shockey and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $12. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, March 2nd, 1931, that the Idaho state flower was officially adopted, the mock orange. Now, in the 1800s, the mock orange was called the syringa, and its botanical name was the Philadelphus lewisii which now we know tells us that this plant was discovered by Meriwether Lewis on the Lewis and Clark expedition. And indeed it was. In fact, Meriwether found this plant on the 4th of July in 1806. Native Americans used the straight stems of mock orange to make arrows, which is how it earned the common name arrowwood. And both the leaves and the bark of the mock orange contain the compound saponin, which tells us that it's a natural source of soap. Now, as a shrub, mock oranges are a favorite of gardeners thanks to their beautiful flush of late spring, early summer flowers. A 1924 article said, The mock orange comes in the wake of the lilac, a little more resplendent and more carefree, as if to ease our sense of loss for that fair daughter of springtime. Isn't that sweet? And I thought you would enjoy hearing about how the mock orange came to be the state flower of Idaho. It all centers on this woman named Emma Sarah Edwards. Emma's father, John Edwards, had served as the governor of Missouri, and he and his wife, Emma Jean, had raised Emma in Stockton, California. As a young woman, Emma had attended art school in New York, but on her trip back home to California, she stopped in Boise to visit friends. And her visit ended up being a turning point in her life when she landed a job as an art teacher. To her surprise and delight, 
Emma won the contest for her design of the state seal, which Emma described this way. The state flower, the mock orange, grows at a woman's feet, while the ripened wheat grows as high as her shoulders. Well, Emma lived the rest of her life in Idaho, and she had the distinct honor of being the only woman to have ever designed a state seal. And there's an interesting postscript to Emma's story. In 1957, Emma's signature and the mock orange was removed from the state seal when it was updated by the artist Paul Evans. But in 1994, after a public campaign, Emma's name was restored to the seal alongside Paul's. However, the mock orange, the state flower of Idaho, did not get put back on the seal, and it remains that way to this day. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Hey, thanks for spending part of your day with The Daily Gardener. If you want to read even more botanical brevities, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. That's where you can find all the stories, biographies, and books that I share on the show. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. It has lots of goodies in it, and I try to make the newsletter like you're getting a marvelous letter from a garden friend. You can always find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Twitter and you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can easily share your gardener greetings or book submissions by emailing me at jennifer at the dailygardener.org. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely May Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, and Eric Begay. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.